Bienvenue à cette première rencontre de la série Les Dialogues McGill-McCord, présentée dans le cadre des célébrations du bicentenaire de l'Université McGill, mais aussi en relation étroite avec l'exposition Voix autochtone d'aujourd'hui, Savoir, Trauma, Résilience. I'm Maria Luisa Romano, Head of Education, Community Engagement and Cultural Programs at the McCord Museum. On behalf of the museum team and of McGill School of Continuing Studies, I, um, sorry, I welcome you to this first meeting of the mcgill mccord Dialogues presented as part of the bicentennial celebrations of McGill University and in close connection with the exhibition Indigenous Voices of Today, Knowledge, Trauma and Resilience. Avant toute chose, euh, je voudrais reconnaître que le Musée McCord est situé en territoire qui est fréquenté, excusez-moi, fréquenté et occupé depuis des millénaires par les peuples autochtones et qui n'a jamais été cédé par voie de traité. La nation Guignangueaga démontre toujours un fort attachement envers ce territoire qu'elle nomme Djodjiagé et reconnaissant notre passé colonial et ses conséquences désastreuses pour les premiers peuples, le Musée McCord considère qu'il est de son devoir de contribuer à une meilleure connaissance des cultures autochtones et à leur revitalisation. L'exposition Voix autochtone d'aujourd'hui illustre justement cette volonté du musée donc, réalisée par la commissaire Euronwendat Elisabeth Kane, l'exposition présente une centaine d'objets accompagnés de témoignages recueillis auprès de personnes provenant des 11 nations autochtones au Québec. Les objets ont été, ont été identifiés par l'INU Jean Saint-Onge de la Maison de transmission de la culture unie, euh, INU excusez, à Chapatouan, à Ouachat. Et c'est donc euh, la découverte de points de vue et de récits à travers la parole de membres des communautés que le public peut rencontrer euh, au cours du parcours de cette exposition. Donc, ça se passe en trois temps. On aborde les savoirs, les traumas et la force de résilience des Autochtones. Et afin de faire résonner cette exposition et son propos encore plus largement, l'École de l'éducation permanente et le musée ont souhaité accueillir trois invités qui exposeront leur parcours et des expériences évocatrices. La, la, la conférence, la série commence cette semaine et se poursuit dans les deux prochaines semaines. Aussi, en ce 30 septembre, nous souhaitons souligner de manière sensible, ouverte et éducative la Journée de la vérité et de la réconciliation et offrir l'occasion au public et à nous tous qui sommes ici de prendre un moment de réflexion sur la difficile histoire des pensionnats et sur leurs impacts profonds. I will now give the floor to Dr. Carola Weil, Dean of Continuing Studies at McGill University. And just before, I would like to sincerely thank her, as well as Dr. Karen Cecilia, Associate Professor and Director of Indigenous Relations Initiative, Paula Bernardino, Chair of the School of Continuing Studies Bicentennial Committee, and several other members of the school for all the reflection and their work invested in preparing for today's meeting and those to come. Thank you. Merci. Merci, Maria Luisa. Welcome. Bienvenue. Can you hear me all right? Great. Thank you. Sego Tansi Tunga Sugit. My name is Carola Weil, and I'm Dean of Continuing Studies at McGill University. Thank you to Madame Sauvage and President of the McCord Board, Gilaine Picard, and the staff of the McCord Museum for hosting us. But today, we are gathered in Jodiage, also known as Montréal, the traditional territory of indigenous peoples, including the Haudenosaunee and Achinabi nations. McGill honors, recognizes, and respects these nations as the traditional stewards of the lands and waters from which we host today's event in the spirit of the longhouse, or gathering place that used to bring people from all over together in Kanagawa. As you know, today is a very special day. The federal government has instituted a National Day for Truth and Reconciliation on September 30th to recognize the history and legacy of residential schools and to commemorate and honor their, the experience of indigenous victims and survivors. This day coincides with the orange t-shirt day in recognition of the harm the residential school system did to indigenous children and uh, children's self-esteem and well-being. For many of us, we can only imagine the pain and the tragedy that has befallen these children, survivors, and their communities. But we stand in solidarity 
Each one of us can and must make their own sense of this history and how we can support our First Nations, Inu and Métis sisters and brothers, friends, colleagues, and neighbors. As a daughter of a Holocaust survivor myself, I am reminded of the call to action never again. Today, many commemorative events are taking place across the McGill campus, across Montréal, across Quebec, and across Canada. The McGill flag atop the McCall McBain, or Arts Building, is flown at half mast today. So I, I invite you to take a moment with me of reflection to commemorate in our own personal way the indigenous victims and survivors. If you will please join me in a moment of silence. We are also here to celebrate the future that arises out of past history. In 2021, McGill University turned 200, making it one of the oldest and most venerated universities in Canada. And this week, we also celebrate the 100th homecoming of former students of McGill University. At the same time, this very museum, the McCord Museum, turns 100 as well. And the McGill School of Continuing Studies turned 50 not too long ago. As we celebrate the beginning of McGill University's third and the McCord's second century, we have an opportunity to reimagine the role that institutions of learning and culture like McGill University and the McCord Museum can and should play in the life of our diverse society. This is an opportunity for McGillians to reinforce our ties with our neighbors and local communities across the country and the world. As we commemorate these auspicious points in history, we recognize that when we stand together, we can have more positive impact. As we, uh, so the timing was perfect to partner with our neighbors and create the McGill-McCord Dialogue Series to mark these special anniversaries and to take continuing education and lifelong learning on a journey beyond the ivory tower of higher education and museum walls alone. This dialogue series is intended to be an inclusive conversation that further connects educational and cultural institutions with our surrounding community and with each other. We will do so not only through the topics presented over the course of several sessions in these coming months, that uh, tie together exhibitions at the McCord Museum with expertise at McGill, but also by taking this conversation out onto the street, literally, into the McCord Museum's urban forest next door. And I invite you to join us for these conversations. These dialogues are here for you, our community of friends, neighbors, students, alumni, colleagues, and passers-by to actively engage with the ideas and images that McGill and McCord offer to help shape our own knowledge and the future before us. I want to thank my colleagues both at McGill School of Continuing Studies and at the museum for their hard work and creativity in standing up this partnership and series. A special word of appreciation goes to Paula Bernardino and uh, to Maria Luisa Romano. Thank you very much. Today, we are holding the inaugural event of the series. On this National Day for Truth and Reconciliation, we are so fortunate to hear from McGill's own Professor Wanda Gabriel. I will now let my colleague, Dr. Carmen Cecilia, Director of the Indigenous Relations Initiative at the McGill School of Continuing Studies, introduce our speaker. Miigwech, Nagurmi, Nyawe, thank you very much. Thank you. Goy. I have the honor of introducing Wanda Gabriel, who I'm proud to call a colleague and a friend. 
Wanda Gabriel is assistant professor at McGill University School of, um, of Social Work. She has worked nationally on several projects such as the Aboriginal Healing Foundation, the Canadian Aboriginal AIDS Network, National Parole Board of Canada, and the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. In her university role, she is the co-director of the qualifying year for Master's of Social Work degree and the co-director of Indigenous Access McGill. She is presently involved with a research team composed of partners from Concordia University, Quebec Native Women, and Elizabeth Fry Association. The project is to identify the rehabilitation needs of Indigenous women in Quebec's provincial prisons and to uh, um, uh, assess the institutional policies that support and constrain Indigenous women's capacity for rehabilitation. I'd like to welcome Wanda Gabriel. What can I do? Say Guego, Wanda Noro Yajets, Gonna say Dagi Rono. Good afternoon. Thank you for this lovely invitation. I greeted you in the language of the Ganya Gehage, and I told you welcoming words and told you that I come from Ganasadage, which is about 65 kilometers northwest of Montreal. It's, a, it's an honor to be here to, um, to be a part of this uh, launching of the series of Indigenous Voices here at McCord. I think it's a, a wonderful, um, action to lift up the 11 nations here in Quebec, to lift up and showcase the gifts that we bring to our world, the gifts that we bring to our people. So I'm looking forward to visit the uh, exhibition. I haven't had a chance yet. I did get a chance to see the entrance and um, the beautiful multimedia display happening and seeing some familiar voices of the people I know in in our indigenous community. And uh, I thank McCord and uh, all the partners for putting together such a wonderful exhibition. Um, I um, brought with me um, some sweetgrass. And the sweetgrass is braided into three. And I thought sweetgrass would be significant today because when we braid the sweetgrass, we have the three strands. And the three strands represent love, hope, and peace. And I, I believe that a day of reconciliation, of truth and reconciliation, provides us with love, hope, and peace for the future generations. As we are taught in the Horonoshuni way, we need to consider the next seven generations that are coming behind us, that are walking behind us. So I, I brought this to, to, to keep that uh, in mind as we go through this uh, presentation today. You know, speaking about residential school, speaking about the, um, the uh, truth and reconciliation is a really personal topic for many of us indigenous people. Um, we live uh, the impacts of, of residential school, we live the impacts of genocide on a day-to-day -day basis. And so when we talk about these things, it really pulls at our heart. Um, and I wanna you know, honor my grandmother who you see here circled in red where she attended Shingwak Residential School. I would not be here if my grandmother did not survive Shingwak Residential School. I would not be here if she was one of the children who, were, uh, who died at the school and were buried at the school. So I'm really thankful for my grandmother. She, she survived with uh, tenacity and um, resilience. Um, she went to the Shingwak Residential School when she was five years old and she came back when she was 17. She didn't speak her language anymore. She didn't look uh, and talk and walk or act like anybody from Ganesadage. But in her tenacity and her perseverance, she relearned the language um, and um, raised a family of 13. Uh, 13, 13 children, and so we have a huge Gabriel family. She, um, she was very um, devoted to the Christian faith and Protestant, in the Protestant church, and in our church, in Ganesadag at the Oka United Church, we have a, 
the Lord's Prayer hanging in the church, and it was embroidered by her hand. And so I am really uh, uh, grateful to have that remembrance of her uh, and to know the, uh, the journey she, she took. It, interestingly, I didn't learn about her participation in residential school until 1993 when Ganesadage, we were putting together a history book of our own history after having lived the 1990 Oka crisis. We wanted to understand where we came from and how do we get to where we were in 1990. So understanding our history was part of that and gathering all the information we could, historical documents that we could uh, to put together our history. We visited uh, Shingwak Residential School and I learned then that my grandmother had attended. It was not talked about, uh, was not talked about uh, this um, dark period of her life. But in, 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 in doing the research, we learned more and more about um, her journey and her experience at residential school. And also being with residential school survivors at that, um, there was a gathering, a healing circle of survivors. And many of those survivors on that day were telling their story for the very first time. And some of them were in their 70s, you know, late 70s, and releasing the story, releasing the pain. So it was a really hard time. Uh, the, the healing circle lasted for three days, and I think I cried for three days, realizing that my grandmother and her sister had attended that residential school. And to hear the horror and the terror stories that the children experienced was, was heart-wrenching. So I honor my grandmother, Gladys, Gladys Jacobs, and her sister Mary for the journey that they, they had to take and the return home. Their, their, their journey was amazing, amazingly uh, resilient. I want to talk about the Truth and Reconciliation Commission because I was um, a part of the um, health support team uh, when the Truth and Reconciliation Commission was um, gathering, gathering all the data, all the stories of residential school survivors. So I was part of um, putting together supports for the events that were happening across Canada, um, the national events and the regional events. And I just have to uh, honor also um, the commissioners, the work that they undertook, the, uh, the capacity, the spiritual and emotional capacity that they had to be able to hold the horror stories that they heard over and over again across the country. You know, Mary Sinclair, Chief Little Child, um, and Marie Wilson, just amazing uh, work that they did and, and how they how they compassionate, compassionately put together supports for residential school survivors. And also the um, Truth and Reconciliation Commission had an a advisory council of residential school survivors who were there to advise the commissioners on the process and who you know, gave many, many, many hours of their time to support the commission process. And one of them is uh, Madeleine Basile, who you'll see on the to uh, complete left side. She was the Quebec representative. Um, and there's Gordon Williams, but his picture's not there. He was the Ontario representative uh, who ha he has now passed on. So I just wanted to mention these individuals uh, and with gratitude and honor for, for the work that they did um, to, to uh, roll out the, the commission's work. Oops. Today, uh, Orange Shirt Day, a national day of reconciliation. I wanted to talk a little bit about Orange Shirt Day. Uh, I see some of you wearing the orange shirt, and I'm really happy to see that. And as I walked around the city today, coming here, I also saw other people wearing the orange shirt. I know back home in our communities, you know, Gunasadog and Gunawaga, all the orange shirts are sold out. You can't, you can't buy one. So Orange Shirt Day began in uh, Williams Lake in 2013 in British Columbia um, and has you know, since spread to schools across Canada and BC. And it's about the legacy of the St. Joseph Mission School in British Columbia. Um, and it was about a young girl, Phyllis Webstad, who was given a t-shirt, an orange t-shirt by her grandmother when she went off to school. Um, but when she got to the school, um, the shirt was taken away from her. And um, so, in part of, as part of Phyllis's healing, she reinstated the use of the orange T-shirt um, to honor uh, the journey of residential school survivors to create a day of truth and reconciliation. 
And since, since we've had this uh, Orange Shirt Day, today has now become a federal holiday, uh, which is you know, a, a big step in, towards reconciliation and honoring uh, and taking time to commemorate the journey of residential school survivors, I think is an important move, uh, an important action to really take reconciliation to the action level. So, you know, I'm grateful to have this day. There's still some work to do around the day, I think, uh, since this was, you know, sprung on us pretty, pretty late in the, sea, in the time to be able to, to adequately uh, do what we need to do around this day. But there's many things happening across the city, and I'm really happy about that, to see that happening. Um, also, this... This September 24th, I was uh, surprised and amazed to see this, a statement of apology by the Catholic bishops of Canada to the indigenous peoples of this land. And this came out on September 24th uh, in, time, in time for the seven, September 30th day. Um, however, um, as much as many um, of our people, residential school survivors, have been asking for this apology, it comes a little late. And there is, um, there's going to be a delegation of indigenous people and Catholic bishops um, venturing out to meet Pope Francis, um, to engage with Pope Francis in the reconciliation process. Um, so a delegation of indigenous survivors, elders, knowledge keepers, and youth will meet with the Holy Father in Rome in December 2021. Uh, Pope Francis will encounter and listen to the indigenous participants so as to discern how he can support our common desire to renew relationships and walk together along the path of hope in the coming years. So we're, I know many residential school survivors are looking forward to the outcome of this meeting and to see what, what uh, the Pope, Pope Francis will undertake. So I thought I'd just um, underline this statement of apology. The... Um, I wanted the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, I wanted to spend time to remind us that the Truth and Reconciliation Commission comes out of an agreement, a settlement agreement between residential school survivors, um, national indigenous agencies, and the government of Canada, and the churches of Canada. It's an agreement, it was an agreement to settle, to put to rest the claims for compensation for the harms committed in residential school. There were many indigenous people who were making claims against the church and against the government of Canada to settle and make compensation for the horrors and harms caused by the school run by the state. And there was, um, there was you know, an outpour from residential school survivors to have this to have compensation. And so it's the largest class action settlement in Canadian history. And there's several components to, to, to it, and we'll get into that. Um, so the, it was recognized the damage that was inflicted by residential schools to the students. It established a multi-billion dollar fund to help former students reco in recovery. So there was five components to the Indian Residential School Settlement Agreement. There was the common experience payment, which was um, for all residential school survivors who attended residential school, everybody received $10,000, those who attended residential school. Um, and then they received $3,000 for every year they were at the school. And so anybody who, anybody who attended school who was alive could apply to the common experience payment. If survivors felt that the um, common experience payment was not justifiably enough to compensate for the harms done, there was the independent assessment process, which survivors could apply uh, to receive a higher compensation amount. And the compensation, in independent assessment process, um, residential school survivors had to apply. They had to fill out an application and submit an application to the Department of Indian Affairs in the Department of Indian Residential School Settlement Agreement. And the, um, 
the um, application and the assessment of this independent assessment process, there was compensation rules and there was a point assigned to the, to the harms caused. So there had to be uh, an identification of the acts that were proven. And some of the things that I'm gonna say are very, very hard to hear, very uh, uh, difficult to, to handle, but so, the, so in the application, they had to prove if there were, so the highest point they could get was 45 to 60 points for repeated persistent incidents of anal or vaginal, vaginal intercourse or persistent incidents of anal and vaginal penetration with an object. So that was the top level of compensation. So those are, they had to prove these acts and there were seven categories. I won't go into them because they're very graphic and very harmful, but there's seven different acts of uh, proven, proven to, and they were assigned points from, like I said, 45 to 60 points to five to 25 points. And then there was another category of the levels of harm, consequential harm. And so there was five levels. And again, the consequential harms would be uh, continued harm resulting in serious dysfunction, um, evidenced by psychotic disorganization, lo loss of ego boundaries, personality disorders, pregnancy resulting from defined sexual assault, uh, forced termination of pregnancy. So that's one category of the levels of harm, and that you could have 20 to 25 points assigned to it. And then there's uh, also aggravating factors that were, um, that also you could get up to five to 15 points. So there's verbal abuse, racist acts, threats, intimidation, um, inability to complain, humiliation, degradation, sexual abuse accompanied by violence. So that was some of the ideas around aggravating factors. And then there was, um, if students had to undergo future care, such as a medical treatment or counseling or psychiatric treatment. So they were given additional points for additional compensation dollars if they had to uh, acquire some future care. And then there was consequential loss of opportunity, which was another level of points. So an example is a chronic inability to obtain employment, chronic, chronic inability to retain employment. So there again, anywhere from 21 to 25 points for compensation, um, consequential losses of opportunity. So, so you have an assessor who's going through all of these applications where they've had to describe in detail under these, these points of harm, identifying the harms. So you can imagine, I mean, like I, I list, I just, um, I'm in awe of survivors that actually took the time to fulfill this application. Uh, and once they did the application, then it was determined whether or not they would meet and sit in front of an adjudicator to tell their story after the application was completed. And uh, to date, the highest amount paid out is $250,000 for some of those abuses that I have identified. And so there's, you know, in their assessment process, they have, if the person had one to 10 points, compensation points, then they could receive five to $10,000. And it goes on until uh, 121 points or more, they could receive a max of $275,000. So, you know, I, residential school survivors have made a great sacrifice in their educational journey, but also in the healing journey. And when you think about what they had to go through to be recognized and to be compensated uh, in the independent assessment process. And so they had to sit with an adjudicator uh, and tell their story, and then the adjudicator would meet uh, and determine whether or not it was valid um, enough to be compensated. There were survivors who did not, who were not accepted in this application, which was very, very, very hurtful. Because you can imagine pouring out your whole heart and soul uh, and retelling that story in detail again. And, not, and to not be compensated, the harm that that caused. Uh, as part of the agreement, there was health and healing services that were provided, uh, which I was part of. Um, so each event, uh, whether it was a national event or regional event or um, local event, there was health 
support workers who were um, employed by Health Canada. And there was a whole army, I will say an army of health helpers across Canada in each province. I think in Quebec we had 80 people who were part of the part of the team and I was part of training many uh, I gave many trainings to Health Canada to prepare the health support workers to deal with the disclosures of residential school survivors and so they when they were meeting when survivors had the opportunity to meet with the adjudicator they had the opportunity to have cultural support as well as um, um, health support workers so they were part of walking with the person to deal with their to deal with their disclosures they were also available they were at the site on site when there was national events there was a national event in montreal um, and all over all over canada where um, stories were gathered were collected to bring to bring the truth to light so the the truth and reconciliation commission is also was part of what the survivors asked for as part of the settlement agreement, not only to be compensated, but they said, we do not want this to happen ever again in, in, our, in, in this lifetime, in our history. We don't want this to be part of history, but we want it to be documented. We want to document the story that we experienced. And so we want there to be a Truth and Reconciliation Commission that would archive all of the storytelling of residential school survivors and their family members. And so the Truth and Reconciliation Commission comes out of that settlement. As well, um, there was funding available for commemoration for communities to have commemoration events at the residential school sites um, to commemorate the experience and honor the residential school survivors and their resiliency. So part of the residential school um, agreement was to host national events. So there were seven national events held across Canada, uh, Vancouver, Montreal, Halifax, uh, up in Yellowknife, um, seven, where else, Saskatoon. So across the country there were seven national events. And it was to gather documents and statements about residential school and the legacy. It was to find, to fund truth and reconciliation events at the community level. It was to recommend commemoration initiatives to the go federal government for funding, as well as to set up a research center that will permanently house the commission's records and documents, which the parties were ob obligated to provide to the commission, thereby establishing a living legacy of the commission's work and to issue a report with recommendations. That's part of the, the TRC's commission's uh, obligations that they fulfilled. As part of the, um, the seven events, the national events that occurred across Canada, as I said, there was a team of cultural support people, there was health support people, and each event was guided by the seven sacred teachings of the Anishinaabe, um, Anishinaabe uh, teachings, grandfather teachings for the seven national events. And so each event, the theme was focused around respect, each, at each place, it was a different theme, but the, the, the whole events were wrapped with these, with these values, with these teachings. Respect, courage, love, truth, uh, humility, honesty, and wisdom. And so these teachings were, were the theme for each of the events across, across the country. So in gathering the stories, it was quite the, you know, I think back on those days, it was quite the process um, of, of, of being a part of this monumental historical time where people were coming to share their stories. Um, and the way this setup was, it was, it was created with a lot of safety, it was created with a lot of compassion. Residential school survivors could share their story in front of the commissioners, in front of a, a plenary, as we're like we're doing right now, um, and they were supported by cultural people or um, health support workers, and they would get up in public and speak, and it was filmed. Then there was um, another type of, of smaller, more intimate uh, opportunity where they were in a smaller room, a smaller circle uh, of just residential school survivors each telling their story, or you could have um, 
a one-to-one -one, um, sharing if, if survivors didn't want to have a public, a public a sharing. And they would have their family members, again, and cultural support and um, um, health support workers. And also the, the events had uh, translators. They had uh, the indigenous languages. They had the translators for Inuk, uh, Anishinaabe, Kanyakehage, uh, um, French, English. So it was really well done. Um, so there was as many as 155,000 visits to the seven national events and over 9,000 residential school survivors registered to, to tell the story. It also held 238 days of local hearings in 77 communities across the country. So I can't imagine this whole machine moving across the country to gather the stories. Statements were gathered at public sharings and sharing circles at national, regional, and community events and at the commission hearings they were also collected through private conversations with statement gatherers. That's right, there was also statement gatherers who their job was to gather the statements, uh, whether it was in those circles or in the one-to-one -one, uh, space. The commission also made concerted efforts to gather statements from former staff of residential schools with the assistance of the church parties to the settlement agreement. The commission conducted 96 separate interviews with former staff and the children of former staff. So in, at, the end, at the end of the commission's journey, close to 7,000 um, statements were collected. And they're, they're archived with the uh, National Reconciliation Center. Um, and so you can, you can visit these, uh, this site and, and hear some stories and, um, and hear the, the strength and courage and resiliency that survivors bring to this process. Um, the process um, of these events, it was really important, as I shared, to have the grandfather's teachings, um, and each event had the theme. Traditional knowledge, traditional knowledge and practice guided much of the commission's work. There was ceremony, and traditional observance played an important part in the national events. So we had traditional uh, gatekeepers who were part of, the, part of the process, part of the planning, part of the development, uh, there were sacred fires lit at the beginning of each national event and at every day's proceedings, and at every day's proceedings got, uh, began with a ceremony. So every event, national event, had a sacred fire going the whole time they were, they were in, in session. Um, and people would be doing the proper protocols for that uh, ceremony uh, to, to protect the spiritual process that was happening with... Um, residential school survivors and the participants. So ceremony was really important part of it. Um, as much as possible, uh, cultural protocols, customs, and traditions of Aboriginal peoples in each territory were respected wherever the commission was. Uh, and also these ceremonies and traditional practices were also held at regional and community events. And many communities had these events and uh, you know wrapped with the traditional ceremonial practices. So it was, really, it was really an amazing process to have indigenous ways of doing respected and acknowledged and celebrated by the way that we held that space and carried that space for residential school survivors. Um, witnessing, and expressions of, and, uh, witnessing and expressions of reconciliation. So part of the uh, national events was to invite witnesses to come and be part of witness because being Bearing witness is, is a cultural practice that our people have in, in to be able to witness when something is happening. So there was many honorable guests invited. For an example, at the time, um, Mikhail Jean, who was the governor general, was invited at the time to participate and, and, and come and give her, her thoughts and feelings. Uh, the Right Honorable David Johnston, uh, two former prime ministers, uh, Right Honorable Joe Clark, the Right Honorable Paul Martin, and two formal former national Aboriginal leaders, Chief Phil Fontaine, who himself was a residential school survivor at the time, the Assembly of First Nations, and former Ambassador Mary Simon, who is now our Governor General, um, and the past president of the Inuit Tepirit Kantemi, and a host of other distinguished individuals who agreed to be uh, honorary, to serve as honorary witnesses. The commission received more than 180 expressions from individuals and organizations 
uh, and the parties to the settlement agreement who wish to publicly state their commitment to the journey and he of healing and reconciliation and to speak to the ways in which they were contributing to that journey. So it was really a powerful time when people were really speaking about the actions and how they were going to contribute to reconciliation. Um, and this Bentwood box was tra traveled with everybody uh, to the national events. And it was on the stage when the commissioners were sitting out um, to, um, to have as a container to hold some of the commitments and um, actions of reconciliation. And this box is just a beautiful uh, box that was carved by a Coast Salish carver, Luke Martson. And it's become part of the uh, permanent legacy of the TRC, and it's housed in the National Center for Truth and Reconciliation. What do I have? Um, the structure, like the calls to action, um, are broken up into different uh, categories. Uh, if you haven't read them yet, please look at the different categories in child welfare. It's from one to five. Uh, education is from six to 12, numbered. Um, language and culture is 13 to 17. Health is 18 to 24. And justice is 25 to 42. And so, to, you know, these are the structures of the calls to action. So if you're not familiar with, I invite you to, to, look, at, um, to look at this um, and to consider what, what would you, what would be your action of reconciliation? And I'm, I know time is, is going by, but I wanted to share um, a quote, some thoughts from Murray Sinclair that were said a few years ago that have always st stayed with me. And I leave them with, with all of us as educators or social workers or healthcare providers here. These questions that he brought forth in what we need to, we have to, in, in aiding in reconciliation, we have to be able to help the youth answer four questions. And we need to consider the indigenous youth because indigenous youth in Canada, age zero to 25, represent 40, I think it's around 46% of our population right now. So it's a big population coming up. And so institutions, education, health, et cetera, we have to be able to help them answer these questions. Where do I come from? Where am I going? Why am I here? Who am I? And what do I want to be? And we need to be providing the answers to these questions through teachings the traditional cultural teachings, and the Western teachings as well. And also, this is for Indigenous youth, but also for non-Indigenous Canadians, to ask yourselves these questions. To ask yourselves these, these questions as we move forward in reconciliation. And one of the things that Murray Sinclair said was that in being able to give answers and teachings to students around these questions, we will help them deal with the emptiness, the deep emptiness that sits in the youth, the loss of identity, the feeling of confusion, the deep sadness and anger that our youth are carrying from intergenerational trauma. And so in doing so, we'll be able to give them a sense of validation. And also what Marie Sinclair said is that the answer to these questions will reduce the sense of victimization and that sense of feeling lost and this feelings of lack of self-respect and loss of identity and also the sadness connected. So for us working in the institutions, education or whatever we're working in, we have to be able to give these answers to these questions and to do so, to be able to give them knowledge that walks in two worlds, that comes from two worlds, not just the Western world, but we need to reclaim our cultural practices and lift up those cultural practices and honor them and validate them. So I leave you with that. We need to, I leave you with those thoughts and I wanna open up the floor for any questions that you may have. Look forward to your questions. I'm gonna grab my mic over here. Yes, I wanted to also just end on this. We're talking further consideration on reconciliation. Maria Campbell, you cannot reconcile a relationship that never existed. We don't need any more sorries. 
we have closets full of sorries. There's no word in Cree for reconciliation. Only, I don't speak Cree, I won't be able to do it justice. Only, which means setting things right. Setting things right. It's time to set things right. Restoring what is ours would set things right. Giving our land back would set things right. Maria Campbell. What a wonderful way to end with that quote, Wanda. Thank you. Uh, we'll open it up the, uh, the floor to uh, questions. If you want to ask your question in French, please, in French or in or in English. And, oh, we've got some. Maybe it's me. Okay. Uh, regarding uh, the children that did not survive, was there any space for their families? Was there any uh, space made during this process for them? Certainly during the, uh, the events and families came forward and discussed my child never came home. Um, it was documented for sure. Um, and the cultural support people were there to support them, um, but to give them answers. The commission couldn't give them answers. We're getting answers now where we're seeing uh, recovered uh, children's graves coming, coming to the surface. There's no, at this time, there's no uh, compensation for, uh, so compensation had to be for living residential school survivors. But I, I would hope, I mean, I hope that what we're gonna see happen for all of these children that we're, we're hearing about, I think we're at 6,500 now recovered uh, graves, that we're going to see some kind of recognition and compensation for the family members. That would be the humane, compassionate thing to do, I believe. There's got to be some more questions. Here, over here. OK, can you pass it on? Thank you. Hi. Um, as an indigenous youth, how would you recommend or give guidance to attacking these questions that you mentioned? That's an excellent question. And it's, it's a question that all of us educators need to answer and to look at our curriculums, whether we're in education, social work, across all disciplines, how are we going to incorporate in our curriculum ways that are gonna help students reclaim their identity and not feel ashamed about who they are and not feel inferior about walking this country. So our curriculums need to incorporate not just the Western disciplines that they're learning, but also the indigenous ways of being and knowing. So, you know, I call it a walking in two worlds curriculum that this is how, this is how I, you know, built my education by taking what I needed in the social work dis discipline, but also as a helper to take healing practices from traditional healers and to com combine that to make, to make it, you know, manageable and doable in our world because we do walk in two worlds. Yeah. So, thank you. Any other questions? Maybe I'll take the microphone and you can just okay. stand right there. Sure. Yeah. Great. 
Um, one of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission in the report has 20, 94 calls to action. Is there a national board, national commission that is taking stock of what is taking place? Because a lot of calls to action are really directed to the federal government. Um, the um, Yellowhead Institute is keeping track of the number of calls to action that have been completed to date. Um, so there is, I think, yes, there are a lot um, directed towards the government for uh, systemic structural changes to happen. Uh, on an individual level, I think what individual level people need to uh, understand, answer the question themselves. Where do we come from as Canadians? What is our history as Canadians, the true history? In history, in, in high school, uh, I didn't learn the true history. I, I was challenged. I challenged my history teacher, and I failed history. I failed high school because I challenged the history that was being taught. It didn't match what was being taught in my own home. So we have to understand where we're coming from, all of us. That's part of that's part of our duty as individuals in reconciliation. Where are we coming from? What, you know, those questions, where am I going? Where are we going? Are we going to continue as a country to exploit and oppress? Or are we going to create partnerships, collaborations, respectful, respectful collaborations? And, you know, the... The, the answers to what needs to happen are there, and they come from the voices of indigenous people. Um, the Royal Commission on Aboriginal People, which was re released in 1998, there was 400 plus recommendations and calls to action. The TRC had 94 calls to action. The Murdered and Missing Women and Children had 240 calls to action. The Vienne Commission here in Quebec has 142 calls to action. And the Aboriginal Healing Foundation had 10 years of healing programs and has solid healing practices that have been effective in community. They did an impact evaluation of the healing programs that were undertaken in the 10 years of life of the Aboriginal Healing Foundation. So the answers are there from indigenous people in these reports. Can we, can we take them off the shelf? and dust them off and put them to action and in, in a partnership, in a collaborative way? I hope that answered your question. It did. Thank any, you so any, other, any other questions before we wrap it up? Well, I, Wanda, I want to thank you very much for, uh, for sharing the stories of residential schools, sharing the truth. Um, reconciliation cannot start with us actually hearing the truth. And you mentioned um, the seven uh, generation principle. And uh, for those of you who may not know, it's uh, what that principle is, is that an action you take today will be sustainable for the next seven generations. So I have a challenge for every single individual here and those that are streaming is you heard Wanda speak today. She spoke the truth. If you can share what you learned with one individual and make a change in that individual, if they can share the truth about what happened uh, with, uh, with the residential schools, that is part of reconciliation. So that is my challenge, uh, my challenge to you. Um, we're going to continue the dialogues. The next dialogue will be on October 7th. We have invited Nakuset, who mm -hmm. is the executive director, you know very well, I know very well. <laughs> of the women's shelter uh, in um, Montreal. And uh, uh, on, uh, I hope to, uh, I hope that uh, we'll see you, you back here. Thank you very much. Uh, merci, Niawen, uh, Nakumik, and uh, um, we'll close with that. Thank you, everybody. Nyawakoa.